Welcome to New City Church. Uh, my name is Kevin Ha. I'm the lead pastor here at New City Church. And last Sunday, Pastor Delante kicked off a brand new summer series called Summer in the Psalms. And uh, he did a great job uh, preaching from Psalm 1. Today, we're going to look at Psalm 3 in a sermon entitled Facing Our Fear and Anxiety. You know, Psalm 3 is the first psalm in the genre of laments. Um, there are lots of laments in the uh, uh, in the Psalms, they're, ba they're basically prayers of people just crying out to God, complaining, crying out to God in the midst of injustice, crying out to God in the midst of darkness and fear. So it is essentially a prayer. It was probably uh, a song, made into a song as well, but it's essentially a prayer. And like most laments, you will notice when we read the passage that it's pretty blunt. You know, it's pretty raw. It, it sounds kind of weird to us in some ways. There's a lot of emotion uh, behind this. So just a warning. The title of this psalm tells us that it's a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. His, uh, one of his sons basically led a coup and decided to try to kill his father and all his supporters. And that's what's going on. And that's when he wrote this. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, this is also the first psalm that contains the phrase Selah. Selah is also uh, Manny's daughter's name. Uh, but uh, Selah actually is a kind of a mysterious word. Scholars don't know exactly what it means. But most scholars believe that it means pause or rest. Um, and so, or, or silence. And so uh, it, they, they think it's some sort of a musical notation because this was a, a song. And so I think as we sing it or read it and we, came, we come to a Selah, you're supposed to pause. Maybe in silence and contemplate what you have just heard before you go on. So I, I love that, reading pausing, contemplating. And so that's what we're going to do as we read Psalm 3 this morning. Psalm 3. Lord, how many are your foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Selah. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain, Selah. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Selah. We're going to go through the psalm sort of phrase by phrase today in today's sermon, but I want to start out with the most, uh, this one phrase that sticks out the most. Um, you can't help it. It just kind of grabs you and you go, what do we do with this? Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Um, it, it's, it's pretty gruesome, and, and there's a lot of anger in here. So what do we do with stuff like this in the Bible? I think we're called to learn from it. Um, it, it's, it's a prayer full of emotion. He's lamenting and praying for justice, and he's praying for vengeance. You know, as Christians, we, uh, we are often taught to say the right things or feel the right things, and, um, and, and, and just, just 
whatever we do, just kind of stuff our emotions, if we have anger, if we have fear, even the sense of injustice or uh, whatever, we should just stuff it and just say nice things, polish prayers of grandeur to God. And then there are others who say, well, you know, if you got emotions, you got a lot of stuff going on, you need to vent it. You need to express it. But actually, the scripture tells us neither to stuff our emotions or just vent our emotions. The scriptures tell us to pray our emotions to God. So if you're angry, if you're, if you're fearful, if you feel a sense of injustice, if, you, if you're, not, you're not just called to stuff your emotions or, or to just vent it for venting's sake, you're called to pray. Cry out to God. You call to pray your emotions. That's where laments are. That's why it's so raw, because there's a lot of stuff that's pretty raw inside of us. God's not calling us to pray this prepackaged prayer that's polite and nice. God's calling us to pray that raw, real, authentic prayer that comes from the heart. Because if you think about it, when you get to know people, when you, get, when you develop a relationship with them, do you just want to polish, manicure, relationship of politeness? I mean, that only goes so far. If you really love someone, you want to be real with them, right? And if you believe that about your relationship with, our, with other people, do you think God wants anything less with you? Do you think God is satisfied with just this polished relationship with you? He wants a real relationship. That's why the psalmists are crying out in a real way. You know, Lord, I I am ticked. I am pissed off. But but break the jaws of my enemies, oh, Lord. They're trying to kill me. I mean, it's real. It's not really a, uh, a statement about the ethics of how to deal with your enemies. It is a teaching about how to be real with God in our prayers. Okay? And so that, that's, that's what's going on right here. Now, one context of the psalm is, as I said, it's written by David at the time that he's fleeing from Absalom. Absalom is one of his sons. He had many sons and uh, led a rebellion. Uh, and he won the hearts of Israel. Most people started to support Absalom instead of David, and, uh, and so David was uh, forced to flee, not only, by him, not only himself, but all his family, plus thousands of people in Jerusalem who supported him, were now fleeing because Absalom has tens of thousands of uh, men after him just hunt, trying to hunt him down and kill him. So obviously, uh, he's angry. Obviously, David is angry. And in, an, in that anger, and he's also fearful of his life. He's afraid of what's going on. And it is in that context that he writes this uh, psalm. So we're going to see, what we want to see is two things from this psalm. One, what is fear? And secondly, how do we handle fear? So let's start out with what is fear? The first section tells us a little bit about what fear is. He says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. I think if you look at this, there are two layers of fear in David here. First, you can see that he's afraid of physical danger. Obviously, you got tens of thousands of people literally trying to hunt you down and kill you. You, you know, it, it's pretty reasonable to be fearful for your life and for others. I mean, I think there are rational fears and irrational fears. We call irrational fears phobia. Um, you know, when you have a fear of flying or when you have fear of uh, Um, fear of monsters under your bed, whatever. Those might be phobias. But Psalms here in particular are not about irrational fears. They're, they're, They're about real fears. But, you know, it's not just these, um, uh, 
external layer of fear that he's talking about. I think there's a two layer of fear. If you look at verse two, it says, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. He doesn't just feel attacked physically, but he also feels attacked psychologically, sociologically, and spiritually as well. And, and, and the hearts of people of Israel have gone to Absalom. And now they're saying of David, well, God's not in his side anymore. God is not for him. I mean, they, they, you know, he has sinned. They know the story of David's sin, that he's not an innocent man. He, he's killed a man. He's committed adultery. His life was far from perfect. And his son, he, you know, there were, they, they were, they were, there were incest going on in his family. His life, his family was completely dysfunctional. And a lot of people lost trust in him as king. And probably came to believe he is not a man of God that we can trust. So David not only felt physically in danger, but he also felt condemned, judged, excluded, ostracized by his own people and by his own son. You know, maybe the kind of fear that you and I face is not as bad as David. You know, we don't have an army, tens of thousands of people trying to hunt us down and kill us. We don't have uh, a nation of people condemning us. But our fears are real, nonetheless. We have fears of getting physically hurt. We have fears of getting sick, fears of death, fears of losing someone we love. Fears of rejection, of losing our reputation, of not making our ends meet. Uh, fear of insignificance, fear of conflict, fear of commitments, or fear of injustice and all that is going on in this world. All of these things are very real. How do we handle these fears? You know, it's not just fear. There's also this sense of anxiety that underlies our fear in our lives. We fear most of the time. You could actually uh, point to the external stimuli that's creating the fear in your life. But with anxiety, we feel insecure just on the inside generally about losing something. When we feel fear... We kind of know what's going on. You know, our hearts start to beat faster. Our, our hands get sweaty and our amygdala just takes over and we have this fight or flight kind of thing going on. And there's, there's a lot of instinct that comes with fear, the primal emotion of fear, a lot of emotion. But anxiety is not like that, right? Anxiety is sort of this deep feeling inside of us, deep, something Deep, we can't even describe it. It just gnaws at us. It's just like eating at us. You know, there's, there's this deep desire in our heart to feel like we matter, feel like we're accepted, feel like we're approved, and that we're loved, that we're okay, that we're somebody. There's, there's this need for that in our hearts, but there's also this deep feeling in our heart that feels like maybe I'm not acceptable, maybe I'm not approved, maybe I'm not loved. And so that sense of insecurity within us just gnaws at us and creates anxiety, especially when something that we've been holding on to for our security, something that we've been holding on to for identity, meaning, significance, something that shows us that maybe we're not all that bad, maybe we are somebody, maybe, and then that thing is at risk, anxiety flares up, right? Anxiety flares up. You know, I heard a story about George Foreman and NPR just the other day. He was telling you the story of what happened. As you know, George Foreman was one of the greatest fighters, uh, heavyweight champion of the world. He was in the top of the world. He was never, ever defeated until he fought Muhammad Ali, and Ali defeated him. And he tells a story of how his life completely turned black, dark, lost. He lost an anchor 
for his life. He said, you know, he ended up finding God, and in that relationship with God, he came back together in a different way. But he tells a story about how he felt like the thing that mattered to him the most, the thing that he put his security on was gone. He, he was no longer the champion. He was no longer the undefeated champion. And, and, and that just broke him, and he was left in a state of insecurity. Who am I? And, and just in a state of anxiety and fear about even losing everything else. If I'm not that, who am I? He talks about. You know, when we face fear and anxiety, that there's just so much negative uh, things that we experience. We experience, I mean, we can fall into depression. We can fall into uh, just this sense of lostness. We can just feel detached from people. We can feel stress. Um, we can feel angry. Whatever. There's so much that goes on. But you know, what really happens after that is that as we feel those kinds of things, we get angry. You have an anger problem? Maybe part of your anger problem is coming from this. You feel angry. Sometimes we start making bad judgments. We start judging other people. And so many things come out of fear and anxiety. Now, how do we handle fear and anxiety? So we're going to continue to read the psalm. Um, but as we introduce verse 3, I just want to say this one thing. No matter what you're experiencing, no matter how uh, fearful you feel, how anxious you feel, how stressed out you are, how guilty you feel, how doubtful you feel, how depressed you feel, no matter what you are going through, I want you to know that there is hope because the next, se next sentence starts out with, but, amen, but, but you, Lord, are a shield around me. Amen? I'm going to talk about four things to uh, help us handle our uh, fear and anxiety. The first is this. Follow God even when you're scared. Follow God even when you're scared. Now, we get that from this passage. You are a shield. Lord, you are a shield around me. Now, what does that mean, by the way? Um, I don't know very much about shields. Um, I'm not a particular expert in that area, but I, I, um, I read some commentaries that says that this shield around me is a particular kind of a shield. Uh, when you think of a shield, uh, you typically think of this round thing that Captain America <laughs> you know, has in his hand, right? That's what you're thinking. But actually, there's another kind of a shield that's the size of a, a huge door, you know, and multiple people come together and they come, they become a force. It's sort of like this. I, saw, I found that on Google. I don't know if that's real or not, but that's, it's, it's kind of like that. That's what you can imagine. And so uh, this kind of shield is a shield around you. It's not just in front of you. It's around you. It is not a shield to escape from from danger. It is a shield to actually go into danger. This is the Marine. They're the, they're the first team to go into battle. So when David is saying, you are a shield around me, he's not saying that God is going to shield you from danger. He's, saying, he's, he's not saying that all the things that causes uh, fear and anxiety in your life is going to just magically disappear. That's not what he means. He's saying that as we go forward, as we obey God in the midst of our anxiety, God is going to do something in them and through them. God is going to do something beautiful even in the midst of our dangers, even in the midst of our very difficult situation. You know... Um, I recently found out that I'm an um, enneagram three. I don't know if you know anything about enneagram, but it's very interesting. It talks about your sin tendencies. And my sin tendency is to go to uh, an eight negative. If you know what I'm talking about, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But my sin tendency is to actually 
to avoid conflict and just <laughs> sweep it under the rug because I don't like conflict. And so when, when, and when situations get rough, I, I just try to swallow it and just go, it's all right, just sweep it under the rug. Everything's cool. You know, I think we do that in our marriage as well, although Grace has talked, uh, Grace and I, we have, we actually are pretty good about this, but in, 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 as I do counseling, um, I hear a lot of marriages in which they're actually afraid of conflict and fight so much that they're not willing to deal with the elephant in the room. They're just like sweeping it, sweeping it under the rug and saying, everything is good. We're happy. See how good looking we are. You know, whatever. See, see how happy we look. You know, that, that's, I, I think there's a tendency to do that because we're afraid of losing the relationship. We're afraid of conflict. We're afraid of what this might mean. We were afraid of being rejected. We're afraid. And so you hide things from people, maybe from your spouse. But I think God is calling us to go into the issue, not run away from them. And as we follow Jesus as we follow God, even in midst of all of the issues, even if it creates chaos, even if it creates conflict, even if it creates all kinds of issues in our lives, as you face them, as you follow Jesus in them, God's going to do something through that to make something more beautiful in your life. Don't be afraid to face the issues that you fear in your life. You've got to go through them because God is a shield around you. You're going to go through it, and God's going to work something through it. You know, I was thinking about this. In New Testament, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, right? And I will make you fishers of people. Well, if you think about it, that's like saying, face your fears. What's the, what's the most scary thing in the world? Like, maybe the way you're going to die. Maybe, like, beaten and hung naked on a cross, left to die slowly. I mean, that's, it's one of, the, one of the most brutus, brutalist forms of execution ever invented by a human being. It's the scariest thing, but Jesus is saying, face your fears, take up the cross, and follow me. Face your fears, follow me, and I will make you fishers of man. You know, I think one of the things that this means is that we have to think about how we decide things. Um, sometimes we decide things based on how safe everything is. It's, you know, is the neighborhood safe? Is, is the school safe? Is the relationship safe? Is, uh, is this decision safe to make? Or, you know, it's, what, is, what is the likelihood of success? I, I'm not saying that these things are not uh, bad things to consider when you're making a decision, but if that is the most important thing driving the decisions you make for your life, where you live, everything that you do, then your fear is controlling your life. What if we made our decisions not based on whether it's safe or not, but what if we made our decisions based on where God's heart is and what he wants, his will, his passion, and just join him in the work that God is doing? What if you were willing to align your life and your heart with whatever God's heart's at and you were even willing to be unsafe for it? Facing your fears. Amen? Amen? Second thing. The second thing is this. Examine the source of your significance. So in verse 3 now, he says, um, you are my glory, the lifter of my head. And I, I think David is essentially saying, you know, I'm scared. And so I used to make something else the source of my glory, but now you, O oh Lord, are the source of my glory. That's what he's saying. But what, so what is glory? Glory means weighty. It means really important, significant. That's what, it, in the glory in Hebrew, it's this word kabod, which actually literally means weighty. And so you can actually mean fat as well. 
and so glory. Um, but it, 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 it just it means that it's just weighty significance. It, 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 it really means significance. It's something so important. And he's saying something else has been my glory, my identity, my significance. But now you, O oh Lord, are my glory, my significance. Maybe in David's past, it was power that was his glory, that was his significance. I am the king of Israel that gives me significance. But you know, he lost that. Maybe he thought his family was his significance. But they were pretty dysfunctional. Now he's got his son trying to kill him. Maybe he thought it was his righteousness that created significance in his life. But he murdered and committed adultery. I think he was trying to build his life on his own significance and glory. But he's now coming to the Lord and saying, you are my glory. He is my significance. You know, in order to do that, you have to kind of dig into your heart a little bit, you know. You have to begin to ask the question, what is my heart really after? He's, he's going after the cause of his anxiety. What, what am I really getting my significance from? Is this success? Maybe that's why I'm having so much anxiety over my job. Is it my family? Maybe, there's, maybe that's why I have so much anxiety over my family? Is it my looks? Maybe that's why I, you know, I have issues. I, I don't know how they feel because I never had the issue. <laughs> God did not bless me with that temptation. But anyway, um, or is it money? You know, maybe, maybe that's why you have so much anxiety about finances. All of these are good things, but when they become the source of your significance in your life, the source of your life, then it produces anxiety and fear in your life. So what we need to do is we need to relocate our glory. We have to find our significance and worth from God. I, as Rose share our identity of who we are from God, Lord, you are my glory. And if I have you, O oh Lord, nothing else matters. Everything else pales in comparison. So I think this means that we do have to go through a process of digging into our hearts and figuring out the source of our life and significance. Sometimes it's hidden. Sometimes we don't even know what's really causing our anxiety we have to dig into that second layer of fear and see where it's coming from and i think for david as i said i think it's he used to find his glory in power in family in in righteousness and in riches and that 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 was what made him significant and glorious but now he's shifting and saying no Lord, you are my glory. He's, he's gone after. He's, he's beginning to dig into the mess of his heart. He is a broken man. He came to see that he has no significance apart from God. He can't find significance on his own. Only in God. He's declaring that he's shifting from himself to God. And that's why he's able to say, you are my glory the one who lifts my head high. So, you know, how do we do this in real life? Um, you know, I, I think it's really hard to do this on our own, to, to dig in to see what's really going on in our heart. What is our source of significance is that, that's causing all this anxiety? I, I think it's really hard to do that. Sometimes you need a spiritual director. Sometimes you can use a therapist to help you out on this. Sometimes... Um, whatever it is, I think it needs some sort of community. Uh, I think one of the best ways to do it is 12 steps. Their step four is all about digging into what's going on inside of their hearts. What is the, uh, the real idols of the heart? Um, you know, just having a uh, deep mentoring relationship with other Christians might help you as well. Discipleship. 
Discipleship, not in just these are the rules to follow, but let's dig into what's really going on in our hearts and who our real source of significance is. Is it really about our glory or is it really about God's glory? Someone who can help you work through some of those things. I think it's really important to do so in community. So that's the second thing, um, to uh, examine the source of our significance. The third thing is this, see Jesus on the cross. And it's right here in this passage, by the way. And you're thinking, where? I don't see it. Uh, how did I get that? Um, now, so David says, you're my glory. You're the, you're the one who lifts my head, right? Um, how does he know that God would do that? What does it mean to lift his head? It means to accept him, approve of him, and say, you're okay. That's what it means, right? Now, how does he know God's going to do that to him? In the midst of fear and anxiety, how, how do we know that God would lift our head up high? How do we know that God is proud of us and he accepts us? Well, this is what David said. David says in verse 4, I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. So how does he know? Because God answers from the holy mountain. What is, what is the holy mountain? That's Mount Zion. That's where the tabernacle was. That's where the sacrifices of atonement were made. That's where the presence of God was at. But you know, I don't think it was just this general knowledge that God, sin, God died for our sin through the sacrifices of lambs or bulls or whatever that they were doing in the tabernacle. I think David would, was also influenced um, by the story of Abraham told in Genesis chapter 15, Um, because I think this story gives him a glimpse of something more than the tabernacle uh, on the holy hill. Um, the, The reason that I think David was thinking about Genesis 15 is because the same words show up in the beginning of Genesis chapter 15 as it does in Psalm 3. So it's pretty clear that he read Genesis 15. Um, and so in Genesis 15, what's going on is that Abraham is scared and God comes to him and says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. In other words, your glory. Now, Genesis 15 is part of the Torah, um, which is... Uh, which is often referred to as the book of Moses, and um, David often referred to it just as the law with a capital L. And so if you read in the psalm, I will meditate on the law day and night. He's not saying I will meditate on just his rules day and night. He's actually saying I will meditate on the stories, like the stories in Genesis chapter 15. So Because it's about how Abraham handled fear, and I think in midst of his fear and crisis, I think he was looking and thinking about it because he spent a lot of time meditating as he talked about in other Psalms. Um, And so, how did uh, Abraham handle his fear? After God said, I am your shield, I am your glory, and don't be afraid, God promises him something. And Abram says, how do I know? You know, how do I know you're going to do that? It's so in verse 8, it says, Abram says, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I would gain possession of it? It's, 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 it's interesting. God did something that night, and I'm sure David meditated on this day and night. Um, and I think David might be asking that same question. How do I know that you are my shield? How do I know that you are my great reward, my glory? How do I know that, Lord, you are for me? How do I know that you will bless me? How do I know that you're the one who lifts my head higher? And God said, take a bunch of animals and cut it in two. Take a, take a bull, heifer, ram, a bunch of birds, and cut it into two. And you're thinking, well, that's kind of weird. But to Abraham, he knew exactly what that meant. God wanted to enter into a covenant. Because in the ancient world, that's how they enter into a covenant. Right now, if you want to enter into a, a contract covenant with somebody, you just sign it, and maybe you get it notarized. 
Um, but that's about it. But in the ancient days, if you wanted to enter into a covenant, a contract with someone, you, you call the neighborhood together and you cut up these animals and you walk in between them and says, if I breach this contract, may it happen, may I be cut up like these animals. <laughs> that's, maybe if we do that, more people will be... Uh, more people would take contracts and covenant. Well, what next marriage ceremony, that's what we're going to do. We're going to cut off some animals and go, may this happen to me if I cheat on my wife. I think that would... Or a husband. Just trying to be egalitarian here. Anyway, uh, side point. Uh, but th- that, was what, that, that was what was going on. So now Abraham was ready to, um, to, to hear from God and saying he... Fully expected God to say, walk in between animals and say, may I never violate the law of God, always trust in him, blah, 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 or I will be cut off like this. That's what he was expecting God to do. But God didn't ask him to do that. Instead, what happened was that a smoking pot moved through in between the animals in the middle of the night. And what God was saying to Abram at the time was that I promise to give you this blessing to you and to your descendants. I promise to honor and take away your sins, uh, honor you and take away your sin and give you this blessing, even if I have to be cut up, even if I have to be cut off, even if I have to pay the price of your violation, I will bless you. That's what the Lord was essentially saying. And David knew that. David meditated on this passage. And that's why David could say, You are the one who lifts my head. You know, but David didn't know what you and I know. That centuries later, darkness came down on Calvary's hill. And Jesus Christ, as Isaiah said, was cut off from the land of the living. And that's how you and I know that he loves us. That he embraces us that he values us, and he lifts our head up high. It's because of what he has done. That's why we say we have to look to the cross. David is calling us to look to the ultimate one who has been lifted up so that you can be lifted up. And when this reality of the gospel, this good news, lands in your heart and to the degree that you allow the love of God, to the degree that you allow the cross of God to penetrate into your heart, I believe that is the degree to which you will be free from your fear and anxiety. You know, interesting thing is that that's not the end of the psalm. There's just one more thing, the last thing cause us to seek justice for the people. In verse 5, he says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord. Deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Selah. Now, if you look at verse 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8, it seems like you're just sort of getting angry, like, you know, strike the enemy's jaws and all that. But if you look at this whole passage very carefully, it's very interesting. He's essentially saying it's not enough that we, we have inner peace now. If you look at verse 5 and 6, you go, I can sleep. I have, I'm not insomniac anymore. I have peace. I don't have fear. I don't have this personal anxiety. Even if tens of thousands of army come against me, I will not fear. There's this sense of peace, right? You see that he has? But it's not enough to deal just with our personal fear, personal issue, and come to a personal peace. It's not enough. Now he says... I'm going to seek justice. 
He wants justice. Look, look at verse 8. It says, may your blessings be on your people. He's saying, deliver me for my people, for the justice of my people. He knows that Absalom is not going to be a good king. He knows Absalom is not the one that God has chosen. Therefore, what is he going to do with the peace that God has given him? Now he's going to seek peace. He's going to seek peace for the people. He's going to seek justice for his people. He's focusing not on himself, but on others. If you look at the entire time, it's very personal. On me, me, me. And then now, so for my people, I'm seeking deliver me. And I want, he says, I want blessings on your people. That's what we're called to do as well. As we liberate ourselves through the cross. Now God is calling us to seek peace, to seek justice for our neighborhood, for people who are marginalized, for people who are weaker among us, for people who are enslaved. We are called to seek love and justice. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. It is by grace that we stand. Lord, but we also come with people filled with fear and anxiety because of idols that we have placed in our hearts that rule us, govern us, and create fear and anxiety in our lives. Lord, help us to cast them out and submit to you and what you have done in the cross. Lord, help us not to be enslaved by fear, but help us to know that we are a child of God, accepted and approved because of what you have done on the cross for us. And I pray that the reality of your approval and acceptance will penetrate into our hearts and give us the boldness to rule, to cast away and um, move out various different other sources of significance that we have put in where you belong. Lord, help us to help, then help us to be people who can seek justice and love our neighbors with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today, uh, we have the privilege of one of my good friends, one of my best friends visiting us. He's a pastor. His name is Jim Bob Park. That is his name. And, uh, and he was my pastor for years. He's also my classmate. And he's also been a mentor to me as a pastor. He is one of the most incredible men of God that I know. And I've known this guy for, I don't know, like 30 years. So I've asked him to give us the benediction. So, Pastor Jibba, would you give us, to, would you welcome Pastor Jibba for the benediction? Well, we can tell that Pastor lies too. I'm not, uh, I'm a sinner just like you. And um, borrowing the, the words of Henry Blackaby, uh, the world is dark and it keeps on getting darker because it's doing its job. But the problem is not that the world is getting dark, but we're not doing the job of being the light. Now, do not let the world get the best of you. Go out and get the world instead of world getting to you with the love of Christ. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, wonderful love of God, and continued fellowship of the Holy Spirit may be upon you from now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.